So we've been looking at the Lord's Prayer, and uh, uh, today we kind of come to the end of it. Um, and uh, it's a strange way to end it, but um, basically, uh, Jesus teaches us to pray beginning with our Father in heaven and then ends up asking to be delivered from the evil one. Basically, takes you from heaven to hell and everything in the middle in this prayer. Uh, so it's very, very uh, meaningful. So uh, we've been looking at Matthew chapter 6, and Jesus is saying, When you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans. I love that sentence. I just love to read it. Can I read it again? <laughs> Do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. Your Father knows what you need before you ask. This is how you ought to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Well, let's pray. Lord, teach us. Teach us from your word. Teach us how we might trust you and, and how we might uh, deal with temptation in our life and anything that would pull us away from you. Uh, we ask that you would bring deliverance. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Um, you'd think that this Lord's Prayer is pretty non-controversial, right? I mean, it's Everybody kind of says it, you know, in church. Any different church you go to, it's, we say it every Sunday. Uh, it's just kind of something that, that we do. And uh, Christians have done this for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, but a few years ago, did you guys remember a few years ago when the, uh, the millennium thing changed? Uh, we had H2O or whatever that was that was going on. Uh, <laughs> something. Y2K. I knew there was something in there, that number hip thing, you know. And so, uh, anyway... Yeah, so when that, when that all changed, there, over in England, there, there's this guy that nobody ever knows of here, uh, Sir Cliff Richards. And, uh, and he's kind of like the, actually the hottest selling uh, rock and pop singer in England. Never known by the States, you know, but he's really big there. And he's, and he's Sir uh, Cliff Richard. And... Uh, so when, when back years ago when they were having this millennial change, uh, he, he's a follower of Jesus and uh, has done some cool songs with Van Morrison about his faith. And, uh, but um, he released this little CD, uh, just a solo, no, it wasn't an album, just a little solo thing for the, the millennium called the Millennium Prayer. And I actually have a copy of it. And, and uh, what he did was he took the Lord's Prayer set it to music, and then just sings it. And it jumped to the top of the charts in England. It was a huge thing for several days, and then the BBC outlawed it. <laughs> they cut it off the airwaves. It, it was forbidden to be played. Because, who knows? But the, the funny thing was, do you remember that old rock guy, George Michaels? Uh, he'd gotten out of jail for you know, walking on the wild side, and uh, and he'd just gotten out of, of jail at that time. And uh, here's what he said about this uh, this recording of the Lord's Prayer: "This is vile." <laughs> you got you got to picture George Michaels getting out of jail for what he was doing, and say, "This is vile." It is a terrible, terrible misuse of a person's religion to put it out on the rock airwaves like this. It is vile. I'm glad to know that he's sort of the moral character and judge, you know, for, for what ought to be on the airwaves. But, but I thought, how funny. So uh, the media went, went to Cliff Richards and, and asked him about this. And he said, I guess I'm the most controversial rock star in the world at the moment for my Lord's Prayer with the music. Isn't that odd? Doesn't that strike you as, whoa, what happened there? And you can dismiss it and say, well, it's England, you know, <laughs> uh, things happen there. But that's not it. It's that there's something radical in this prayer that is incredibly offensive to people who don't know the Lord. 
And you can dismiss it and say, you know, I mean, a lot of Christians kind of pablum over it, and, uh, but it is extremely radical. And we've looked at, at each part that Jesus says, this is how you ought to pray. This is how you ought to pray, very simply. And we, and we talked about the relationship that we have with God the Father in heaven, who, uh, our Father, and we talked about his will, his intention, his, his purpose, his character uh, being demonstrated on earth just like it is in heaven. And we've talked about the, uh, the looking at the present, you know, and, and give us today, you know, what we need today and not worrying about other things. And then, um, and then for the past, Jesus said, here's, here's the thing for the past, uh, forgive us just as we're forgiving people around us in the same way. So he deals with the present and the past. Now this portion of the prayer, this radical prayer that seemed so vile to George Michael. So it's really about the future. This is the part of the prayer where Jesus deals with the future. And, and um, he says, don't lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, I grew up praying this, you know, don't uh, deliver us from evil, right? That, that's how we do it. Actually, the, the appropriate trans translation uh, in, in the Greek is it's the evil one. It's a personification of evil, and uh, which changes it a, a whole lot. Now, temptation's a weird thing. I, I get that. And it's something that, you know, most of us aren't, aren't all that comfortable with. Um, people make jokes about it, you know, they're not all that funny, but, um, you know, Mae West, I usually avoid temptation unless I can't resist it. There's an insight from a philosopher. Oscar Wilde, I can resist anything but temptation. Uh, you know, that's really good. I've always thought of temptation as the, the lure, the, the attraction, the pull towards the bad, right? Actually, that's not the way it is in the, in the biblical sense. Temptation is, is, is a little different than that in that temptation is the pull and the lure toward <laughs> anything that would undermine our relationship with God toward anything that would, would pose a barrier to it or erode it or, or pull us out of God's caring hand. That's what temptation is. So therefore, temptation can be for, you know, bad stuff, like, like our moms warned us against, you know. It could also be about good stuff, lifestyle, uh, things that we're seeking, acquiring. Why is that? Because Nothing erodes our relationship and our trust with God like a self-satisfied, victorious life. When we get to that point, we don't need the Lord anymore. And we can say, Lord, you go handle somebody else, you know, those problem people, people like Westfall, you know, go take care of him because I got this covered, right? And so actually, this is a prayer that also reminds us not to uh, pursue the things that are going to draw us away from, from our intimate relationship with God. It actually goes for good and bad stuff. That changes it for me because, you know, I thought it was just avoidance of stuff, but it's not. It's what is it that we focus on that's going to pull us out of the, the loving grip of the Lord? Anything. Now, For you Lutherans in here, um, every once in a while we have to quote Martin Luther. There's a hymn. Uh, anybody sing hymns ever? I grew up with these. So yeah, these are this third grade Sunday school. That's what I got. Uh, this is, Almighty fortress is our God. You remember that? Anybody remember that? I was really stunned looking through this uh, this week in the old hymnal. Um, how much it relates to this small portion of the Lord's Prayer. And I've sung it all my life, but I never really tuned into that. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear. 
For God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure, sure, and one little word will fell him. And then he says this, this is about that good and bad stuff that pursues us. Let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also, the body they may kill. God's truth abides still. His kingdom is forever. So I think Martin Luther got it that sometimes it's the goods and family and the things that we surround ourselves in our life that actually undermines our relationship with God and keeps us from moving freely in, in that relationship. You know, we've got our family, we've got our stuff, we've got everything around us, we're okay. We're like, like that TV show Hoarders. You know? We can't walk, we can't get to the bathroom, but we're okay, you know, because we've got our stuff. And, uh, and I think that when we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, it's reminding ourselves and, and uh, God putting back into our mind, what is it that will erode our relationship? And we've got to have, have protection from that. Now, this word temptation, let's talk about that for a minute. Um, testing, tempting, right? Um, putting things through a trial. That, that's all uh, aspects of this word temptation in, in the Bible. And uh, so I can find it here. James chapter 1. Um, Um, blessed is the person who perseveres under trial, under temptation, who perseveres under it. Because when we've stood the test, there again, that another word used for temptation, when we've stood the test, you'll receive the crown of life that God's promised. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. That's important. But each one, get this, is tempted when by our own evil desire we're dragged away and enticed. Then, after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, gives birth to death. So really, the Bible saying God's not the one that does it. It's actually our desires, our uh, unmet needs, our, what's going on in us. It starts out small, and then it gives birth to this, and then it gives birth to that, and it results in that, and it, and it ends up growing. And, uh, and this idea of leading into temptation, it's everybody's tempted, right? I, except you all. You know, I mean, other people out there are tempted. But everybody's tempted, but what does it mean to be led into temptation? So I think that's when, when we are, are caught in the pull and the uh, uh, kind of the eroding power of it, that it, we're gripped by it, and, and, we're, and we're pulled into it and held into it. And, and it's not a passing thing, it's that, it's that we're caught up in it. We're caught up in it. And, and we need to be delivered from the evil one. Now, This brings us to a very, very <laughs> radical thing that I struggle with a lot over the years. I, I got to tell you that. Um, I don't like the idea of Satan. Is that okay to say? I don't like the idea of a personal evil. You know, I, uh, the devil made me do it. Well, take responsibility for yourself. You know, that's so don't come to my office and say the devil made me do it. But, uh, but the thing is, I, I, go, I have to take this seriously because Jesus is saying this is what we ought to be praying. He ends this prayer with, deliver us from the evil one. And if Jesus took it seriously, I thought maybe I ought to also. Maybe, maybe I need to think of it. But that goes so against, you know, we've got this Seattle, New Agey kind of thing, you know, that, that we've all grown accustomed to and we love so much. You know, it's really hard for my new age friends to get the idea of Satan. 
because they really believe that we're all good and we're getting better and you know if we could just you know take a few better steps you know and and it's hard it's hard for our friends and and family and sometimes for us to get this idea that actually evil may be personal it's not just an idea out there it's not just a uh, dynamic in our world or a mistake it that there's actually personal evil and Jesus is saying we need to be delivered from the evil one and that brings us to this whole thing you know Satan um, the devil uh, El Diablo which is actually Greek and Spanish which is cool you know <laughs> but that's the two combined but um, old red legs uh, you get all, all kinds of names for this you know um, I, I lived for 13 years in the Diablo Valley isn't that weird that, that, that a community would name themselves Devil Valley Satan Valley and we were underneath the the peaks and the view of Diablo Mountain Mount Diablo Devil Mountain I mean it's like if you don't know it, you don't care, it's, 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 but, but if you actually believe that there's a personal evil, you go, this is creepy. Why are we living under Devil Mountain and we're driving down Devil Avenue Di or Diablo Boulevard? It's like, no. And how would you like to send your kids to Diablo Elementary School? <laughs> Devil Elementary School. Satan School. That's enough of this Sunday School stuff. We're going to Satan School. Now I'm just saying you know, we even had the we even had the uh, the Devil Mountain Brewery and pizza parlor. So you want a night out with someone you love? Go to, I guess, where the devil drinks. You know, <laughs> at least he makes the brew. And uh, I mean, it's just a whole the whole culture is all naming Satan. Isn't that weird? Now the funny thing is, the the word uh, Diablos um, is not. A noun. It's not a thing, person, place, or thing. Actually, it's a verb. Isn't that weird? In the Bible, it's used as a verb. So, so uh, when Paul is writing to these churches, he's talking about some people who are being really gossipy and undermining the community and the love of the church. You know what he says? Would you tell them to stop deviling, stop diabloing the church? It's a verb. It's, it's what we do, not just, not just uh, you know, an idea that we think about sometimes. So, in the Bible, Satan, the evil one, Diablo, is uh, the deceiver. The one who twists things in our mind, and this is shown throughout scripture, twists things in our mind and accuses us. The accuser, the deceiver, the, the father of lies, one of the, the names, and, uh, and the idea is that it gets us questioning our relationship with God, questioning who we are, questioning the, uh, our world, questioning uh, uh, the realities of, of uh, the Lord in our lives, and, and sets us up believing lies. And, uh, and that's not a rare thing. That's, that's pretty common. Now, what's it mean to be delivered from you? This, I, I had to struggle with this one. Um, I heard a phone. Okay, so Damien uh, ran his phone, I, I think, through the toilet, but I'm not sure. It was filled with water when I took the back off and the battery, and it was not working anymore. So he borrowed Eileen's phone and came over and was doing, we're doing I was going to help him with some laundry and everything, so I ran his clothes through the washer and then found Eileen's phone in the bottom of the washer, mm -hmm. which, you know, at that point, you take the back off and all the water comes out. So we're, we're two phones down at this point, you know. Four cars and two phones down. The West Falls are doing great. And, uh, and, uh, and so I got on the internet and ordered a cheap, crappy phone because we're leaving Sprint. We're going to go to Virgin Mobile and save a bunch of money. So uh, it's a product placement ad for the video. <laughs> so uh, it, it came and it was delivered. And it was, uh, uh, you know, a, night, a brown truck came up kind of turned at our house 
and a nice man got out with a with brown shirt, uniform thing, and brought up this little box and knocked on our door, and gave it to me. I told him, have a nice day. He said, same to you. Got back in his truck and left. And I thought, maybe this is what Jesus is calling us. You know, deliver us from you. Get, give us something, a gift, you know. Give us something nice that we can look forward to. Um, for you really old people, you know, the Wells Fargo wagon is kind of, <laughs> that's a music man, okay. But, um, so then I had to go and look at, what does this word mean in the Bible? What's this word mean in the Bible? Is it a nice, de an anticipating delivery of a good thing that's going to help? No. It means to violently yank something away. It's a violent act. It's a grabbing hold and pulling out. It's not lovingly inviting someone to come with us, you know, or it's, it's not that. It's not an invitation. It's you grab them and you yank them out of it. That's what delivers from, from the evil one is. When we're confronted with the lies and the liar, the deceiver, when we're beginning to doubt our relationship with God, Lord, grab me and yank me out of that. Pull me out of it. Now, anybody here ever been born? Just a test. Okay, one, ten, oh, two, okay, three. Only two people in this whole group have ever been born. See, <laughs> I don't really remember my birth. But I think it doesn't matter if you had a natural birth, uh, the side of the road, uh, and then back into the fields working, or if you had the Lamaze method, you know, where you come out gently in a dark room and you float in water for a while. Um, or if you even had a cesarean, you know, zip, zoop, zap. It doesn't really matter because I'll tell you what. All the all the babies I know before they're born, they're fine where they are. They're comfortable. They're nurtured and nourished and they're loved. And weird people come up and tap mama's belly and say, Oh, you're getting big. You know, you wait till that happens. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. Oh, it already has. Okay. <laughs> well, it'll happen again. But you know, I, and sometimes, you know, you play gentle music so they become smarter than the neighbors, you know, that, that sort of stuff. Or, or you, you play rock and roll so they become tougher than the neighbors. Either way, and uh, it doesn't matter. How, when that baby comes out, it leaves the comfort, the security, the warmth, and it is violently yanked out and put into a place that it doesn't choose. No wonder they cry. No wonder. Now, see, I was, when I was born, I, according to family legend, I was doing it all wrong. Uh, and it shouldn't have been a problem because my mom was tall. She was like know, 5'10 or something, you know. She, she could handle things. And, uh, and so uh, I was butt first, cord around my neck a couple of times and kicking weirdly and just a total disaster baby. Now, guess what happened to me? The same thing that happens to every other baby. Except I got turned around and uncoiled and da, 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 all this stuff happened, you know. It, I've been that way my whole life, you know. Quarter around my neck, butt first, going wrong. I gotta, I'm not getting this. I mean, it's not easy for me. But uh, just as I entered the world, so I will leave it, you know. But, but the thing was, I had to be pulled out of there quickly before more damage was done. They couldn't go to lunch while I was halfway out. They, they had to get this stuff done. And I was put into this world that I did not choose. Now, have you ever seen a baby in utero after 30 years? You know, if you just don't deliver the baby, you just keep it for 30 years? It is not cute. Well, I wasn't cute either. Okay, so, but, but that's not the point. The point is, there comes a time when we've got to be violently yanked out for our life, for our health. And, and that's the essence of how Jesus ends this prayer. Lord, take hold of me. Take hold of me and pull me out. Don't leave me there. Self-satisfied, feeling like my life's good, everything's fine. Or don't leave me there going, well, I'm struggling and I kind of build it around myself, but at least I know the bad I'm in, you know. Uh, I'd rather be with my friends in hell, you know, they're more fun than the 
<laughs> strangers in heaven. You know, uh, there's a sort of, you know, honesty to that. But but the thing is, it's saying whatever situation I'm in, if I'm in a situation where I'm being drawn away from you, where my relationship with you is eroded, take hold of me and yank me out of there. Yank me out of there. So I can live. It's for our life. It's not to hurt us, it's for our life. Now I think God wants to challenge us to not simply pray this prayer week after week by road or off the screen or something like that, you know, just say the word. I think he wants us to think through these things and say, this is radical. This is offensive to many people. If they really understood it, it would be offensive. It challenges our, the basis for a lot of how we live. But anything that erodes our relationship with God, we need to be pulled out. I think that may be one of the most courageous prayers we can pray. Lord, deliver me from evil. Deliver us from evil, from the evil one. <laughs>